name is Devi Ramkasoon, and I am a market system specialist with the Center for Economics and Market Development in the Bureau for Development, Democracy, and Innovation at the U.S. Agency for International Development, which is also called USAID. I currently manage both the E-Trade Alliance as well as the Market Links platform, so it is an especially great pleasure to be with you today in both capacities. The E-Trade Alliance is a global development alliance between USAID and 12 leading private sector partners whose logos you'll see in the current slide and is implemented by Palladium and Nextrade Group. It is aimed at enabling micro, small, and medium-sized firms also known as MSMEs from developing and emerging markets to engage in cross-border e-commerce. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated the impact that e-commerce can have on economic growth. Indeed, e-commerce also has the potential to open new opportunities for developing country MSMEs to grow through trade. Through the E-Trade Alliance, USAID helps advance and accelerate MSMEs use of e-commerce as a means to support inclusive economic growth and job creation worldwide. The Alliance designs and operationalizes interventions to enable new development gains. It works in various global markets where partners' corporate goals are aligned with USAID's development goals. The Alliance also supports MSMEs through all stages of their digital journeys, providing them with applied learning on platform solutions and services to grow their domestic and international online sales with a particularly strong focus on enabling women-led firms in e-commerce. In the last year alone, the E-Trade Alliance supported and trained more than 500 MSMEs around the world on e-commerce, launched dialogues educating over 400 policymakers, industry leaders, and regulators from 36 countries on e-commerce best practices, developed an innovative proof of concept for interoperable national corporate digital IDs, assisted in crafting a fintech loan guarantee for Mexican MSMEs, and published a digital and MSME e-commerce index analyzing policies of 52 countries. Our work through the E-Trade Alliance underscores USAID's commitment to local businesses as the engines of growth and development which is highlighted in our economic growth approach. Our approach centers on promoting private sector-led economic growth as a means to solve critical development challenges. The E-Trade Alliance allows us to implement this approach by bringing together policy guidance, data, analytics, and global good practices for MSMEs to advocate for policies and programs to promote and utilize e-commerce more effectively. These efforts form part of USAID's long-standing work to promote trade and digitization from basic internet connectivity to sophisticated fintechs in developing and emerging nations. These efforts also speak to USAID's digital strategy, which promote, provides a roadmap for our staff and missions to accelerate the development, adoption, and use of digital technologies in countries in which we work. By way of these guiding documents, USAID promotes digitization and e-commerce as a means to encourage inclusive growth, develop a vibrant private sector, and accelerate sustainable development. With that background, I'm really thrilled to, to turn the floor over to Kati Sumanen, founder and CEO of Next Trade Group, as well as the technical director for the E-Trade Alliance to lead us through our discussion today. Kati will moderate a conversation with E-Trade members and partners who will make the case for why enabling e-commerce can be a strong development tool for MSME growth and competitiveness. With that, Kati, over to you. Thanks very much, Davy, um, and thank you all very much for joining. Um, we're thrilled to have this um, uh, event with all of you and discuss more about the work of the E-Trade Alliance. Uh, before we turn to our esteemed panelists, um, I thought to share a couple of slides about um, our work, echoing very much what Davy was talking about. So um, please just uh, do the next slide, please. So um, visually, basically, to um, discuss what Davy mentioned, um, the Alliance works with uh, MSMEs around the world. Uh, our goals are to increase the number of SMEs that sell online 
including on online marketplaces like Amazon, Etsy, eBay, and others, and then increase um, SMEs uh, volumes online, particularly for cross-border commerce. We have five different work streams uh, from, if you want, from 30,000 foot level policy and enabling environment uh, work with governments around the world to um, SME skills development for e-commerce um, uh, directly with SMEs. And then we also pilot uh, innovative solutions for logistics, uh, last mile delivery, um, access to finance, working with fintechs, and um, in inclusive trade, meaning with rural firms, as well as with women-led firms. And you can see our um, uh, URL there at the bottom. Next. Um, so we have a diverse range of companies that come together into the Alliance. Uh, but if you think of them, as part of the ecosystem that supports SMEs in their e-commerce sales cycle, it kind of comes together. Uh, the alliance essentially brings together the various capabilities that SMEs need to go from um, obtaining financing to purchasing uh, supplies to marketing, uh, selling online, uh, carrying out their payment, uh, carrying out their shipment um, and logistics processes to after-sale processes and so forth. So bring these capabilities together. And um, in many cases, our partners have their own individual pro projects uh, with us, but we also bring partners increasingly together to uh, intervene in a multi-partner um, uh, collaboration format. So I'll give you an example in the next slide, please, uh, for that. Um, well, uh, we have here um, uh, some data on how um, MSMEs are uh, engaging in e-commerce around the world. Um, so what we see over and over around the world is that um, MSMEs are mostly social sellers. They are using Facebook, Instagram, and social channels to sell um, online. Um, in Southeast Asia, where this uh, snapshot is from, um, SMEs are also starting to use um, online marketplaces increasingly uh, for their sales, uh, like you know, local marketplaces like Lazada, and then, of course, U.S. marketplaces and local uh, Asian marketplaces as well. Uh, but in the main, um, SMEs are still selling on on the um, on the uh, social platforms. Next, um, why we're excited about SME e-commerce as a means to enable trade and and growth is that we see over and over is that once we get these social sellers and offline sellers into marketplace sellers, um, we tend to see those firms that are selling on marketplaces um, to, to export, they're highly likely to export, and they are also likelier to diversify their markets because uh, these uh, online marketplaces enable them to reach diverse sets of customers around the world in different markets uh, with such uh, greater ease. We see this empirical regularity market after market, and this is why we're doing what we're doing, seeking to enable the offline sellers, the social sellers that are the staple of emerging market sellers to become a marketplace sellers and, and enable them with, um, uh, with different uh, capabilities from logistics to payments um, and uh, financing. Next. Um, so we, we also observe some broader gains from SME e-commerce. Uh, SMEs are around the world uh, scoring new customers through e-commerce, improving their cash flow, in improving their revenue, they're becoming more profitable. And um, um, particularly the larger firms that are already selling on online marketplaces are also securing um, uh, new um, international uh, customers. We see these patterns over and over. It's a very compelling data for us to guide our, our work. Next. However, so why are we in this? Uh, well. You know, still, of course, SMEs are now, as a result of COVID, onboarding marketplaces. They are getting into the digital economy um, in um, at great rates. Uh, we see huge adoption rates um, on uh, of, of for SMEs to use uh, online payments uh, of different kinds of online marketplaces and so forth. However, we also see many challenges that need to be solved in order for SMEs to more effectively um, engage online. Uh, First of all, there are challenges related to um, uh, maintaining their online presence. They're doing their digital marketing, standing out in the crowded uh, online space. Uh, oftentimes, SMEs have challenges receiving payments from foreign customers. 
um, and managing their logistics, dealing with the traditional trade challenges like uh, market access and uh, customs procedures. And then we see SMEs around the world. Uh, this is again a snapshot from Southeast Asia, but we see this echoed around the world, um, uh, wanting more new financing solutions, uh, wanting better digital marketing capabilities, and then um, dealing with the emerging challenges of, of um, uh, say, data privacy rules or other digital regulations. Next. So uh, I'll give you a quick example. So what we observe in market after market are five segments of SMEs, and we seek to tailor our approaches to these different segments. The needs um, vary quite a lot by segments, and the preparation also to do e-commerce vary by segments. So I'll give you an example of uh, how we are operationalizing this work in, in a pilot case in Ecuador. Uh, so if you click, the, click it once, another time. Uh, there, so we're, we have two phased approach um, in an intervention that we're doing with Ecuador. The first focuses on uh, sellers that are more um, advanced already in their e-commerce. They already have their own online stores. The idea they have already exported. And we're working with e-commerce institute, um, eBay, DHL, uh, MasterCard, um, as well as um, Amazon to onboard these sellers on uh, global marketplaces and enable them then to access logistics services, uh, payments, financing, to grow their sales uh, on these global marketplaces and export, particularly to US market. And then we have a phase two, which is for a different segment. So if you click on it uh, one more time, uh, we have a phase two that we're rolling out right now, uh, potentially with partners like uh, Canasta Rosa, which is a platform for women like firms um, out of uh, Mexico for women artisans, uh, DHL's Go Trade program that we'll hear more about, uh, as well as uh, potentially connect Americas from the Inter-American Development Bank. And we're focusing more on the social sellers, those sellers that are in the early, earlier stages of their digital journey and bringing these capabilities together to support them to establish their first online stores and perhaps uh, start to sell locally uh, initially before starting to sell internationally. So that's just one example of how we bring these capabilities together to support different segments of uh, MSMEs. Next. So um, you'll see online, uh, this is the last slide I'll have. Um, if you click it a couple of times still, um, we have a, a, a great deal of resources online um, in a uh, E-Trade uh, Policy Hub and other parts of our website where you can access data on uh, MSMEs, how they are engaging in e-commerce. You have also uh, extensive mappings of how developing countries are enabling SME e-commerce, what programs, policies, um, and so on they have put in place. If we click it one more time. Uh, and one more, please. There we go. So we have not built a number of indices and data products, as well as uh, diagnostics, I believe, by now in 17 different markets uh, on how SMEs are engaging online, what policy issues need to be resolved, what are the best practices and programs for national governments as well as for local governments and other stakeholders to follow to enable SME e-commerce. And um, this year we will have some learning also from our interventions uh, to share uh, with you on uh, what we are learning, how to uh, improve this work, you can always improve, right? And, and um, uh, how we can better scale also these approaches to reach more SMEs. So that's on my side and I'll, um, I'll turn over now to our panel. Um, we will be sharing these slides with you, but, uh, but uh, let's uh, please welcome our panel as the next uh, step. So uh, we have a, a great panel uh, of four members of the Alliance, uh, Maria Luisa Boyce, who is uh, Vice President for International Policy for UPS Global Public Affairs, Erika Libertelli, who is the Executive Director of E-Commerce Institute, uh, Juan McNor, who is the Director for Global Government Engagement, um, and uh, development finance institutions at Visa, as well as Jason Blackman, who is uh, Senior Director for Customs, Trade, Compliance, Regulatory Affairs from DHL Express. Uh, we have a number of geographies here, so I'm thrilled to welcome our panelists. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. So I'll turn it over to uh, Maria Luisa um, as the first speaker to please introduce yourself, um, if you might uh, discuss uh, with us um, a little bit more about why UPS is working with um, uh, MSMEs in e-commerce, 
Um, mm -hmm. Why are you in this alliance? Why does it make sense for you to partner with USAID? Thank you, Maria Luisa. Patti, thank you so much. And, and thank you uh, to USAID and all the partners for putting together this event. My name is Maria Luisa Boyce. Um, I will say I'm originally from Colombia. I grew up living in 20 different countries and, and now I live in the US. Why I mentioned that is because working for uh, as a vice president of global public affairs in UPS, I get to have a, a, an amazing job. And one of them is um, leading our efforts and supporting how do we support small and medium-sized businesses micro small and medium-sized businesses and women-owned businesses we have a women exporter program to be able to to fully engage in international trade as a company we believe it is very important to have an inclusive uh, economic growth and so we have focused our resources on how do we help uh, doing capacity building, how do we help access to market, and how do we provide uh, regulatory uh, recommendations to governments that can improve the business for small businesses. And the other part, Kathy, I love always your statistics. You do an amazing job presenting them. The other part of this is that uh, in e-commerce really is changing the face of trade and the opportunities that are available. And we launched uh, our program with Women Exporter Program, for example, was launched in 2018. When we had the pandemic, uh, though it is fascinating to see out of that uh, this horrible tragedy, how in nine months we saw changes in e-commerce that we expected to take five to 10 years and has given the opportunity to micro and small businesses and to parts of the population that never thought will be able to, to have a business to open up. So that's why we have joined and we're excited to be part of, of this team and with all my colleagues um, to be able to make a difference. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, turning over to uh, Erika. Uh, Erika, please, if you can share a little bit more about um, what e-commerce issues you does um, and why are you in the Alliance? Thank you, Cathy. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's so nice to know that you are uh, showing in from different parts of the world. Uh, first of all, thank you all for your participation today and thank you USAID for this invitation for me. It's an excellent opportunity to share with all of you part of uh, the e-commerce institute work uh, with eTrade Alliance. Uh, I love to be here to discuss uh, education and inclusive digital trade. Um, I'm Erika Libertelli, I'm based in Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina, and I'm the executive director of Latin American Commerce Institute. I've been with this organization uh, for 10 years, and I am leading a global project and the women program and all initiatives of eTrade Alliance on behalf of the E-Commerce Institute. Uh, E-Commerce Institute is a regional leader nonprofit organization uh, present with its work in more than 25 countries, uh, developing initiatives to promote education in digital commerce around the world, especially in South Latin America. Uh, among the uh, main initiatives to promote and boost SMEs, e-commerce and reduction of the knowledge gap. I would like to mention uh, some initiatives. Um, for example, we organize e-commerce day. Uh, e-commerce day is the most important event of training and networking of Latin America uh, with a presence in 18 countries. Um, it has trained um, for free for more than uh, 200,000 participants. Uh, E-Commerce Institute has a powerful center of entrepreneurship where to train and accelerate a great number of startups per year. Uh, we have a big academic offer uh, such as courses, masters, specializations, executive programs, online, in person and blending training uh, with a focus, focus on the different levels of knowledge and sectors of the digital economy. Um, also, we have the e Women program to promote female talent and leadership in the e-commerce industry through training and mentorship, as well as uh, networking events. 
uh, we are part of the Trade Alliance, providing initiatives in order to trade underserved Latin American uh, women-led MSMEs in B2C e-commerce. And also we are organizing digital trade dialogue, dialogues to identify MSMEs needs and solutions, engage key stakeholders and promote enable environment for e-commerce. Uh, you can uh, find uh, more information about the e-commerce institute in the presentation that is shared through the uh, chat box. Thank you so much for the, the, the invitation and for this great opportunity for us. Thanks very much, Erica. Wonderful overview. Um, turning over to Jason now, going to Africa, where Jason is based, um, to hear more about um, how DHL is um, uh, working with us in the Alliance. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Karthi, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, to share with your uh, participants. So, for my sins, I've been at DHL for 28 years, um, involved in looking after the 51 countries in the Sub-Saharan African region as Director for Customs and Regulatory Affairs. Very challenging environment, very diverse, uh, good opportunities, and especially for e-commerce. Um, we've seen an incredible growth over the last two years, particularly driven by the COVID pandemic um, in terms of e-commerce. In some countries, 70, 80% growth in e-commerce and e-commerce opportunities. So it's a very fundamental topic. Um, anybody would be remiss in their obligations to ignore the e-commerce environment in Africa and any other region for that matter. And COVID has just helped accelerate the importance of e-commerce and expanding beyond your domestic borders. And certainly in Africa, DHL has certainly focused on that. And how do we help empower MSMEs to trade cross-border, equip them and upskill them, as well as working with the regulatory agencies where, where we have challenges in terms of how do we get them on board and how we stimulate and foster change and discuss how we facilitate trade with a particular leaning towards e-commerce. And so for us, this particular topic for this webinar today is of particular importance because we've seen during COVID how the pandemic has limited what people can do. We know certainly, for example, as a South African example, that, um, that opening the e-commerce floodgate, so to speak, in May 2019, when they initially, or 2020, when they initially locked down e-commerce totally, and you could only deliver essentials, we saw the return to almost a sense of normalcy when courier companies, for example, were allowed to start delivering non-essential courier products to people's homes. It, 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 it took the edge of the pandemic in some ways, brought comfort to people. And around the world, we're finding a lot more people are looking to bring products from their home countries, especially the diaspora, for example, in Ethiopia, who are around the world who like those home comforts. So e-commerce is important. DHL is very much investing in trade, um, in upskilling and training, and partnering with the Alliance in terms of capacity building, bringing our expertise to the table, and providing guidance, training materials, and facilitating training programs across the region. And there are exciting developments ahead. I'm excited as to what we've seen is on the calendar and schedule in terms of 2022, and how we're expanding across Africa, the partnerships with USAID, and with the, uh, with the other NGOs in terms of how we can make a difference in people's lives, not just from a perspective of DHL as a company, but DHL as a corporately sociable or social responsible company, and how do we help our customers plus the SMMEs to expand across borders? Thank you. Thanks very much, Jason. A wonderful overview. Um, turning now to uh, Wamek from Visa. Wamek, uh, uh, share us a little bit more about why Visa is in the Alliance and, uh, and uh, what do you do? Yes, thank you so much, Kathy. And first of all, it is a really pleasure to be here, uh, to be part of the esteemed panelists, and of course, um, speaking with colleagues from all over the world. Um, so it's really a pleasure to be here and, uh, and thank you so much. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, I am Wamek Noor. I work on Visa's uh, global government engagement team, and I actually support a lot of our work uh, with partnerships with development finance institutions, for example, of course, USAID, World Bank, and other partners, uh, so that we can work together to drive, you know, broader digital transformation in developing countries. Um, in terms of my background, I'm a core international development professional. I worked in the World Bank for many years at CGAP, really working on financial inclusion issues and, and digital, uh, digital payments issues in emerging markets. And um, a lot of my focus at Visa is actually 
focused on the markets of, of Bangladesh, for example, and a lot of the South Asian markets. Um, why? Uh, we're, it's a pleasure to be part of the E-Trade Alliance. I mean, Visa has been engaged in a number of different activities with the Alliance, um, and, and uh, you know, it's, it, you know, it's really been a great opportunity for us to share our experience and also to learn from other organizations in the Alliance um, and, 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 and have a sort of shared vision for broader digital transformation. Um, for us, small and medium businesses are, are, are a critical part of our, our business. We actually made a goal uh, in, right at the onset of the pandemic uh, to digitize 50 million small and medium-sized businesses by the end of 2023. Uh, we are tracking our progress in terms of our global commitment. Uh, and we have been able to achieve uh, about half of that. So about 20, 25 million businesses that we've been able to digitize as well. Um, so, and I think that one of the other aspects, if I may, I wanted to mention, uh, we at Visa recently released our uh, back to business study. It was just released in January. It is focused on our 2022 sort of small and medium business outlook. It's based on surveys with over uh, 2,200 small business owners in a couple of different markets around the world. And I thought I would share uh, for this discussion a couple of interesting insights from that. Uh, first, we learned that uh, an overwhelming 82% of uh, small and medium-sized businesses said they plan to accept some form of digital option in 2020. And 73% see that accepting new forms of payments is actually going to be fundamental to their business growth. Here's the part that's particularly interesting to me. 24% said that they plan to accept digital currencies such as cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. So we're actually seeing a trend where there's a you know, greater emphasis on cryptocurrencies and digital currencies and what does that mean for um, you know, SMBs around the world. Uh, for e-commerce, uh, it was incredible that 90% of the SMBs agreed that their survival through the pandemic was due to increased efforts to sell via e-commerce. And they reported that over half of their revenue, which was 52%, came from online channels over the last three months. And then maybe the last quick stat that I might mention uh, is, um, you know, a majority of the SMBs that we surveyed um, really uh, relying on digital payments and seeing a better, bigger shift to digital payments in the future. So 64% of the respondents anticipated being able to make the shift within the, within the next 10 years and 41% said that they could do it within the next two years. Um, if I may quickly, I also wanted to, uh, you know, give a quick shout out to our Visa Economic Empowerment Institute that has done quite a bit of research Analysis in this area. We had done some survey work on MSMEs uh, in Brazil, Colombia, Malaysia, Philippines, South Africa. Um, and what we learned is that um, the survey respondents were more interested in digital enablement, access to e-commerce, etc., than actual uh, financial assistance in terms of grants or loans from the, from the governments. So this is, if you recall, at, during the course of the pandemic, um, but we're seeing that they have a greater preference for digital uh, enablement than actual uh, financial assistance, grants, or loans from the national government. So I uh, wanted to share those uh, insights. Thanks very much, Womek. Uh, great to hear from everybody uh, on why they are in the Alliance. And of course, uh, everybody has been emphasizing very much that COVID has changed the game if you want uh, really accelerated the adoption of online tools among SMEs and also created new needs for SMEs to gain uh, access to things like digital marketing, logistics services, finance, and so on. And I think from our perspective, one of the power, powerful benefits of the um, Alliance is exactly this, that your companies who are on the front lines of e-commerce markets and you see firsthand the challenges that SMEs wrestle with, uh, we see some of that reflected in research, but you see those challenges also every day dealing with companies. So Maria Luisa wanted to uh, deepen a little bit on this since we have many implementing partners on the line. What are the challenges that you're seeing uh, SMEs facing as they're engaging in e-commerce? And uh, what are some of the solutions that you have developed to deal with these uh, challenges? 
Thank you, Kathy. Um, I think uh, first, one of the things that we have seen that that when we talk about uh, digital commerce and and it's a reality that we cannot forget a lot in developing countries is affordability of access to digital uh, information, right? Let it be through the phone or computer. Sometimes we forget uh, we it's still a battle that we have not won. And so the infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure is one of the challenges that we see, Kathy, and through our programs, uh, it is, it's fascinating for me too when we meet the entrepreneurs that they have innovation and, and ideas where they adapt and, and set up meetings with potential customers at certain times of the day so that they can have, they know they will have access or they, if they're in rural areas that they're going to go to those places. So, so for me, that's one thing that, that is a challenge in, and I'll talk about the solutions in a, in a moment, but the affordability of digital trade. The other piece for MSMEs uh, globally that we have seen is a lot of them are still in the informal economy versus the formal economy. And that provides them, that limits the opportunity of, of what can they do. So, what the pandemic did accelerating this access to customers that otherwise they never thought they could have uh, in a way that they can afford to to promote or to sell they also realize are realizing that there is a need for that formality to be able to have access to to electronic payments or understanding that some of their customers may want to return their their product or how do you handle a refund right all of these things uh, became are, are very, very uh, important. The, the third one, and, and this is in general to all MSMEs, we at UPS, we did a survey in 10 countries, developing and developed countries. And for me, it was fascinating to see that consistent in all the countries, this included UK, US, Canada, and we had a, a, a countries that, 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 that didn't have the same infrastructure in Africa and in Latin America, but all of them, the, the complexity of the regulations and the lack of understanding of what, how can the government help them in some of these things was fascinating because they don't have the time, right? They don't have a, a large a office or group of people looking at what are the regulatory processes to understand better compliance or what are the support the governments are giving to SMBs. And so for me, that was that was the third one. What are we doing as a company? Uh, we're doing we're doing I'll say three things that to address all of these. One, and I think Jason mentioned it, and um, we are also focusing on that capacity building, right? On that training, providing information uh, in in SMB terms, because we can talk all acronyms and all policies and regulations. I'm a I'm a customs nerd and a trade nerd, so I can go very technical very quickly. But but explaining it in terms that the businesses can understand that helps a lot, and and that gives them the peace of mind of knowing that it helps with the second one about being from the informal to the formal economy, that that makes a difference, right? If they have the facts and the information, then they can build the trust to be able to do it. The second thing that we're doing is, is finding solutions uh, of the cost of logistics of exporting or sending out, because for many countries, there was no infrastructure. And if we think about it, the 20th century was built for larger companies to export. Uh, it was a large, and the regulations reflect that, right? It was for larger companies. Now in the 21st century, and especially the past, the last five years, I will say, we are having to change that. How do we approach that for small and medium-sized enterprises? And that's where we are looking for solutions and affordable solutions. And then last but not least, before we move, is really, we're spending a lot of time to talking with a, a governments and, and the entities that have an impact on, on the movement of e-commerce and exports to be a voice for small businesses because small businesses don't have the time usually to go to a big association or be part of a big chamber. They, this is not their, their usual um, medium, right, of where they work. And so we have really taken a, a, a very active a advocacy role for small businesses to explain to, to, to governments how they need to make their regulations less complex, more easy to understand. And, and really that helps to decrease the, the cost of doing business for small businesses. So those are the things. And with the part of the alliance, the trade alliance, that's 
a big value that it brings to us, right, Kati? Because we, we are able to reach out to different governments around the globe. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, Erika, uh, from your vantage point, do you agree with these challenges that Maria Luisa has been identifying? And uh, what are some of the solutions that you have been devising on your side as you've been dealing with um, uh, SMEs, uh, with such a great uh, volume of SMEs across Latin America? Exactly, we, we have common points with Maria Luisa, obviously, because we are in, in Latin America. Um, access to an internet connection, it was an issue, uh, especially uh, during the pandemic, because, for example, uh, the women um, needed to share with her children uh, their devices, for example. So it was really uh, an issue. So. Um, access to own devices, I think, is an, an issue for, for training. Um, accelerant women led firms, uh, digital journeys, is understand that we need to provide tools to, 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 to uh, give possibilities to increase their uh, businesses. Um, so, uh, by improving improv providing um, access to smartphones and computers and online, online payments and marketing capabilities. Um, for example, obviously uh, we have um, problems with the access to financing, uh, talent and services in, in Latin America. So for example, one solution uh, could be to create innovation hubs uh, where um, the women can um, uh, uh, connect to internet, for example. Uh, we need to engage key stakeholders. We need to find sponsors in order to provide elements uh, or tools for training, for example. Um, the, the main barriers uh, to women getting into business um, such as access to business networks, facilities, and financing. Uh, so they, they are a, a really issue for, for them. Um, and other uh, issue is related to marketplaces, for example. Uh, marketplaces fee, uh, payment platforms fee, um, they need to increase sales and exports, and they have barriers with, the, especially with the costs. Um, and obviously, as uh, Maria Luisa mentioned, uh, business informality. Uh, we we found um, a lot of informality in different countries, so uh, it's an issue for us uh, to onboard a marketplace when the the company is not formal. Uh, so we need to, um, to train in this issue, to uh, give support to, to SMEs um, and, and train in leadership. Uh, I think the, the, the most important thing when you design a train, it's not only provide digital commerce uh, content, um, also, we need to uh, provide leadership content in order to um, give uh, possibilities and opportunities to upskilling and grow uh, their businesses. Thank you, Cathy. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, what, what seems to come through from this is that some of the fundamental issues in the digital economy, infrastructure, access to devices, connectivity, is still an issue particularly for certain segments of SMEs and uh, unfortunately for women-led firms as well in markets like Latin America. What are you seeing, Jason, in, in Africa? What are the, the challenges? You already alluded to them. Uh, we are probably uh, all of us familiar with the, some of the fundamental challenges of logistics and digital infrastructure, but what else have you found uh, there in the continent? So what's interesting, Katia, is um, I was making notes as, uh, as my colleagues on the call, they, uh, the participants were uh, panelists were making their, their, their submissions or their discussions and the, the commonalities in the different regions. You know, in Africa, we're seeing similar problems to what you are, are uh, we've seen reference to in Latin America and other regions. So some of the some of the issues within our region, for example, definitely poor infrastructure is a huge challenge for SM, SMEs getting them to getting their products to market, getting to the airports, 
you know, it can often take hours, if not days, to get from rural areas into the main cities to bring their products to market. We're seeing poor and weak national systems and patchwork of regulatory frameworks. The lack of harmonization of the regulatory frameworks is a big challenge, um, especially when it comes to implementing, for example, the African Continental Free Trade Area. That was implemented last year in January, went operationally live, but we haven't seen any real tangible trade taking place. And there's a lot of challenges on the ground that are um, impacting that. One of them being this patchwork of regulatory frameworks, the lack of harmonization. So what regulations may apply in Kenya, may not apply in Nigeria. So it's understanding the regulatory frameworks in which these, these, these entities or can, um, these individual traders, for example, may find themselves. Somebody did mention the regulations and the complexities of the regulations are, are a big, big um, issue in Africa. And, and a lot of the time we're approached by the SM, SMEs about how to unpack those regulatory frameworks and how can we help them to understand the basics of what e-commerce and trading cross-border is. So it's, it's the, the lack of access to training. The capacity building definitely is one of the issues that somebody else raised, absolutely the same in Africa. It's training the public sector and the customs authorities and the regulatory agencies as to what's needed to push forward the trade facilitation agenda, how to give real tangible effect to things like the AFCTFA, um, and, uh, and, and basically promoting for us, most importantly, other than training, the digitization agenda. It's, it's slow to take traction in Africa. We're lagging behind the rest of the world, and that's due to lack of access to, uh, to technology, lack of access to financing. So financing the IT investments that are needed. Um, the infrastructure I've talked about already, that's key. Harmonization. Of, uh, of regulatory frameworks and, and procedures and processes, and how do we reduce the costs of trading at the border and crossing the border? And that's one of the, the focal areas this year that we've got on our agenda in our partnerships with various NGOs and, and with in speaking with USAID yesterday is how do we upskill, train, and, um, and reduce the cost of trading cross borders and finding ways to strip out the complexities of, uh, of exporting, for example. And I've just, for example, just finished a video now for, for customers in South Africa about taking the complexity out of exports. It's a very daunting task. And when we did SME training through some of our alliances last year with um, what they call the Pan-African E-Commerce Initiative, or, or PECI for short, we found out that many of the SMEs were, were, were really scared about the and, and intrepid about crossing the borders and what's involved and, and how difficult it can be. And when you unpack it into simple, scalable modules and training, for example, the look of realization of how easy it can actually be when you take out all that complexity and you give them the basic fundamentals and upskill them, the, 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 the look of, of fear on their faces on the Monday morning when they start to where they end on a Wednesday, it's like, it's not as complicated as it looks. You've unpacked it, you've simplified it, and you've helped to understand what the expectations and requirements are. And that's for us been the real takeaway from last year is the, the training, the upskilling. Um, and then of course, from a regulatory perspective, trying to find out how do we facilitate change management? One of the big, big challenges in Africa when new systems are rolled out or new programs are rolled out, one of the challenges we're seeing is change management and helping to facilitate change management training and, and capacity building with the regulatory authorities in conjunction with similar type of programs with the private sector. Thanks, Kati. Thanks very much, Jason. Um, so not only do we need to train SMEs um, and tailor training to their uh, level of um, uh, knowledge about e-commerce uh, and perhaps dispel some of those fears, but uh, also train um, regulators about what SMEs actually need and how to uh, enable uh, SME e-commerce, including cross-border, which is a big, big challenge. What, what are you seeing, Wamek, uh, from Visa standpoint? Um, uh, we, of course, see payments as a big challenge uh, for some segments of SMEs, although improving much, uh, greatly around the world, thanks to Visa and others. Uh, but uh, what are some of the challenges that you have been facing in your work? Yes, thank you so much, Kati. So I would agree with all the challenges um, and opportunities that have been mentioned. I mean, I think we are seeing really the, the same thing. One of the focus, um, and Kati, as you were mentioning, the focus on infrastructure and connectivity, and as uh, colleagues are mentioning cross-border. I think the broader challenges that we're seeing and something that we can really focus on is working together to maximize the benefits and remove the remaining impediments 
for local small businesses anywhere across the world in developing countries to connect across international borders, to export more, to connect to global value chains, because fundamentally we've seen that because that, that has made them more resilient, better recover, uh, better grow their business uh, in light of the pandemic. So there's a number of opportunities in that, uh, both on the uh, policy and regulation side, on the technology and solution innovation side, um, on, on, on the digital trading side and, and, and regional blocks, there's a number of different components. And I think we all need to work together to see what those pain points are, what the opportunities are, and how we can work together to really uh, get more local MSMEs to be connected to in, uh, uh, international borders, export more, and connect to global value chains. Um, and, and so I would say that in particular, um, two, two components come out to, to me. One is um, the, the global interoperability discussion. Um, we're seeing in developing countries, you know, uh, 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 slowly a greater interconnection between mobile money providers, uh, local digital wallets and bank accounts, and, and those connections where MSMEs can really benefit from that. Uh, but that also can be also used in terms of across the border as well, so that uh, MSMEs have the convenience to really have the choice to, to, to integrate across uh, uh, you know, different platforms and, and export better. This global interoperability discussion will also help drive the scale and impact that we would have uh, you know, to take MSMEs to the, to the next level. So I think that that's something that we should uh, definitely uh, discuss and, and think through further. The other aspect maybe is uh, cross-border electronic payments acceptance. Um, at the end of the day, uh, you know, remittances and other aspects, uh, you need the technology solutions and the latest innovations to allow uh, MSMEs to pay, to, be, to, to receive payments, to pay payments um, in the most safe and secure manner. And so I think what we're seeing is um, an opportunity for really driving electronic payments acceptance and also leveraging the latest solution innovations and technologies that actually meet the needs of, of local MSMEs. And there's some opportunity for that as well. And of course, as our colleagues mentioned, um, and this is from a number of uh, work we've done in developing countries, including Bangladesh, you know, financial education, capacity building, training, uh, digital skills building. We have also seen from our own pilots in this work that that is absolutely critical and we've received, we've you know, and something that definitely, I think, collectively, we should think about further and pursue. Fantastic. Um, well, I think what, what we've seen in the Alliance is um, another kind of powerful benefit for uh, the public sector is, is to partner with um, entities like yourselves that have the expertise, the knowledge, the capabilities that are distinct from those of uh, say USAID and vice versa, then USAID you bring their global networks and the reach with governments and and um, and finance um, uh, and support solutions uh, together with the private sector uh, is a is a very powerful synergy and something that um, I think all of you are bringing to the table with logistics services, capacity building services, payment services um, uh, to the table. Uh, now all of you also have a uh, strong focus on women-led firms, as does USAID, and I'm sure many um, uh, in the audience uh, here as well are focusing on women-led firms. And what we're seeing in our research is that once uh, women-led firms and, and men-led firms are kind of comparable at same levels of digitization, they do uh, very similarly in, um, in e-commerce, but it seems to be a greater struggle for women-led firms to get to a point where they run a formal firm, where they have access to all these technologies um, that's at least coming through our diagnostics uh, over and over in different markets. So I want to ask you, what, what um, are you doing specifically with women-led firms? What are some of the best practices that you might recommend uh, to the implementing partners and others to build women-led firms capacity for, for e-commerce? Aria Luisa, turning it over to you. Thank you, Kathy. You know, it's, it's very interesting. I'm reading some of the comments on the chat. Um, First and foremost, I want to say that 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 uh, women-owned businesses are great. Women are great entrepreneurs, 
Uh, we find uh, amazing stories uh, around the globe. I am I'm very blessed to, to be leading our Women Exporter Program from our Global Public Affairs team in that respect. I think I will say three recommendations that to that I have found, and then it's in your comments and in what my colleagues have said here in the panel. Uh, one, uh, understanding that women are not used to networking as much as as, as men-led firms. So, so we, when we were reaching out for women entrepreneurs, we couldn't find them as easy in in uh, the chamber or an association or etc. It was really more local type of, of, of cooperatives or getting together, and we're talking in, in developing countries. In, in developed countries, there's a little bit more of, of a networking, but, but that's not in their DNA. They're, they're, they're there to work, do their business, take care of their family, and, and that's it, not networking. And so it, and it, giving the importance and, and a little bit of the mentoring, because that's another thing that we do. Not only I'm here, of course, representing UPS Corporation, but we have our UPS Foundation that that has uh, taken as one of their top priorities women, to support women-owned businesses around the world. And so we do a lot of mentoring uh, and understanding why is it important to network. The second thing is the, um, in some instances, is the capacity building is important and the training because that empowers them with the knowledge that that maybe otherwise they wouldn't have access to or they they didn't know they were entrepreneurs and the pandemic actually make them be entrepreneurs and they discover that they like it uh, like in Colombia for example actually women have benefit more uh, in terms of they now own more of the SMBs uh, in in the country because of of going through e-commerce um in in but the capacity is important, but then they put it in, in, in practice. And so to what you were saying about, that's where we see the, the, the power of private-public partnerships. The business side brings that, that sense of urgency of you need to get it done and you have to implement what you learn. You can study and get, capacity, uh, get training in a lot of things, but if you don't know how to implement it and you don't see it turn it into growing your business, then the use of your time, your most important asset, it is is wasted right and so that's that's where i think it's important that we help we work together to create that access to markets for the what that they have the third um the third part is um in many countries what we have seen globally sometimes is is not the regulation is the cultural barriers that exist for women-owned businesses to be able to to be successful and i think that that um, is something that we have to together as a community private public and uh, uh, ngos be able to work not focusing only in the negative right or, or the or the horrible situations which is still happen and ngos are focusing on that but also focusing on the positive and the empowering um, how can we make a change? Because changing a woman's life who is part of a family changes the family, uh, changes the community. And, and I think that's something that we have also looked at that is that we, um, that I would, that I would say make, will make a bigger difference for women entrepreneurs, give them a safe place for them to be entrepreneurs. Thank you, Kathy. Fantastic. I think, Erica, you, you um, um, already uh, mentioned some of these same issues that Maria Luisa is uh, discussing about empowering women, um, showing them that they can be leaders in the digital economy and so forth. What are some of the best practices as you've been working through your e-women program um, to, um, to um, enable women-led firms in e-commerce? What, what, what are some of the um, good, uh, good practices that you might mention? Thank you, Katy. Yes, I agree with Maria Luisa again. <laughs> and I think that the most important thing that uh, we need to keep in mind when we design um, programs uh, for women, uh, we have social, culture, and con cognitive facts. Uh, we are different uh, uh, to the, 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 the men. Um, I can tell about the Latin American experience, but I, I know that uh, each region or country have uh, their particular characteristics. Uh, so in Latin America, the balance between time and learning, it's very important for, for women, okay? Because 
we are in charge uh, of the most uh, task, domestic task and um, uh, child care. So the majority, no? Obviously. Um, and um, for example, we we provide um, online training so the, the women can take the course every day, every time, and whatever, wherever uh, they stay. Uh, and for example, th this is a, a great um, practice. Other is shorter courses because the women has um, a, a little time to, to train. Uh, learning by doing, it's very, very important to, to train uh, into theoretical and practical uh, content. So it's important that they can implement uh, their knowledge to apply their, their knowledge uh, and to design a roadmap for uh, their businesses in the long term. Um, the the e-commerce institute, as I mentioned early, uh, earlier, uh, has a uh, we, women program uh, has a strong focus focus on cultivating participating women's leadership skills. And um, I I I want to to share with you that it's very very important this type of um, training about soft skills, leadership skills. The the women uh, needs to uh, obtain uh, uh, tools related to communication, related to leadership management. Uh, so it's, it's very important this, this point. Um, and other is the importance of pairing women's technical skills development with uh, work to build their leadership skills and peer learning with others. Um, they need to um, see inspirational cases. They need to um, build community. We are special for build communities. We are very, um, we have um, skills in related to build community. So uh, they need to uh, have an ecosystem where, where they can uh, train and uh, share experiences and knowledge. Uh, so I think uh, it's very important access to learning and networks. Um, uh, and I, I insist in this topic that we need to train about capabilities for transaction, digital capabilities and business capabilities too. Thank you. Great, so go beyond, um, indeed train in digital, but also go beyond that to empower women to see themselves as uh, leaders and, and uh, also free up the time. So have very um, adjustable, I guess, uh, learning um, aligned with their schedules and aligned with their work. Jason, are these uh, things that you're observing as you're rolling out the DHL Go Trade program and other DHL programs with women in, in Africa? We're seeing, we're seeing some of the challenges, some of the, very much aligned with what your other participants are saying as well um, in, terms of, in terms of the challenges facing women in Africa. Um, and maybe what I can do is share with you some of the things that we're doing in Africa in terms of, uh, of, of empowering the ladies, so to speak, or, the, or, the, or, or um, you know, in terms of focusing on the, the, the female parts of the trading environment, female um, uh, entrepreneurs and M SMEs. Um, very similar challenges um, that we're picking up on just as a note. So, um, you know, we're seeing things at the, um, in terms of access to formal education, access to technology have already raised, but we're seeing interesting enough, um, similar situations where we're seeing high time requirements of uh, exports and other processes that affect women because of their time um, poverty due to household responsibilities. I think somebody mentioned earlier, we're seeing um, sexual harassment, for example, is one of the challenges we are noticing in, in terms of the trading environment. Um, in terms of beyond the borders and, and other impacting factors, we're seeing issues such as jobs, the small businesses and industry working are less valued in the supply chain and they have a high investment risk, so fewer people are investing in them. We're seeing that female entrepreneurs have less digital skills and limited access to digital technology, 
So what are we doing to try and address that? What are some of the things that we're doing within the context, for example, of our Go Trade program in Africa? We're looking at things like 50-50 gender balances in our trade programs. So some of the KPIs we have set ourselves are how do we upskill um, the female entrepreneurs? And so we have a almost a bias in the um, training programs and the, the upskilling programs that we're running across Africa by ensuring that we are leading those towards the female entrepreneurs and female businesses and making sure that the KPIs measure that. And are we actually achieving success and empowering um, that part of our trading community. In terms of uh, 2023, for example, we've got an objective of trading at least 1,000 SMEs, and focusing in on that is at least a minimum 50-50 gender balance in that uh, SME development training program. We're also basically looking at um, uh, mentoring programs and mentorship. So we've got a fellowship program that we've started where we are linking uh, MBA students to entrepreneurs and leveraging off each other's experiences across Africa so that they can benefit from the practical experience that the entrepreneurs go through and they can le le leverage off the theoretical trainings and uh, business skills that the, uh, the students bring or the MBA students, for example, bring to the table. So lots of opportunity, um, but again, the biggest thing that's standing out for me is training, upskilling and capacity building. Um, that's the key for me in, in Africa and, and from what I'm also listening to from the fellow panelists. Excellent. Thank you. Um, you know, we actually have on our website, um, in the um, uh, E-Trade Alliance's website, a document that Visa co-sponsored last year looking at um, how to set up uh, training programs with women-led firms. And we interviewed uh, everybody here, obviously, and other global programs that work on women-led firms in e-commerce and, and develop kind of an eight-step uh, uh, guide, if you want, to, um, to enable women-led firms. So, well, Mick, you have been uh, very much part of that effort and as, as Visa, and uh, you also have some uh, programs that you have been piloting with women-led firms in Bangladesh, as I understand. So could you share some of, some of the lessons learned and some of the best practices uh, with us? Yes, thank you so much, Kati. And absolutely, as, as, as um, a training, upskilling, capacity building, I think that should be a priority and that should be an emphasis. Actually, one of the uh, uh, programs that we have is practical business skills. And I think what's really interesting about it is that it allows formats or delivery formats that um, cater to the, uh, can be the schedule, the situation, the country context, and, and, and the needs of women. So um, there's like videos uh, that, uh, you know, you can take at your own convenience, short videos, but then are able to get uh, real insights and training on, uh, you know, from money management to a number of other uh, key topics. And so um, translated to different languages. And so this is like one example of um, building kind of programs and curriculum in a way that really meets that particular country context and meets the needs of the women. And if we're able to really evaluate how effective that is. Um, uh, but uh, as Kati, you were saying, I mean, I think for Visa, we've been engaged in um, a number of uh, digital coaching, digital mentoring programs um, across different markets. One of them in particular uh, that I was involved in uh, is in Bangladesh, actually. Uh, we worked with uh, the International Trade Center, uh, She Trades. For those of you that don't know, um, the International Trade Center is a joint venture between the United Nations and the World Trade Organization. Uh, they have their mission to connect uh, 3 million uh, women-led MSMEs to global value chains by the end of 2021. But essentially in Bangladesh, we engaged in a pilot together. Uh, it was focused on deep coaching, mentoring, capacity building on specific topic areas. For example, it was on digital marketing, how they can expand their digital marketing, including leveraging social media networks better. In Bangladesh, we see that uh, Facebook is used uh, by a lot of women-led MSMEs to sell their products, to access new customers and, um, and, and other kinds of um, uh, considerations e-commerce, the, the fundamentals of e-commerce, uh, customer uh, resolution and other, uh, you know, uh, how to kind of drive customer behavior. And so, um, you know, a lot of like deep training modules along those lines. And we actually had some really good results from it, um, if I might 
mention and uh, you know about one hundred twenty thousand dollars in 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 business leads uh, from from the women that were trained. Uh, they were able to access four new international markets: um, USA, Canada, Italy, um, and a hundred percent of the women in the pilot uh, reported strength in digital operations. Um, so it was quite a successful program, and actually we're thinking about replicating that in other market. And then quickly, if I might mention a, a study from the Visa Economic Empowerment Institute uh, that recently came out, it focused on our survey of uh, US small and medium sized businesses. Uh, what was interesting is that for all the new businesses that came up during the pandemic, not pre-pandemic, they were more likely to be led by women and they were more likely to use digital options. Um, and I, we thought that was a really interesting aspect Another aspect we learned from our research uh, in this particular study is that the, the women, the, the women uh, sample and the minority women sample were more likely to export their products to, uh, to markets outside of North America. So Latin America, Africa, Asia. Um, so, you know, while there was equivalent to North America, there was a greater export intensity among minority-owned businesses and women businesses into other markets across the world. So we, I mentioned that because then there's an implication in terms of uh, you know, digital trade policy and what that means for minority-owned businesses and of course women-owned businesses and how we can perhaps drive that further um, and what that makes sense. But it was definitely an interesting insight we found from the Visa Economic Empowerment Institute analysis. Thanks, everybody. Um, we have uh, a lot of great questions uh, coming in the chat. So I may just uh, turn quickly over to a couple of them. They are really challenging. So let's see who wants to be the brave one to go um, for them. One question is from how to reach uh, millions of informal businesses in low income and developing countries and help them go digital. In other words, how do we scale this support uh, and enable uh, informal businesses and another question, perhaps a little bit along these same lines is around um, how do we enable uh, the development or, or change the development industry writ large uh, to, to go deeper with SMEs? Uh, perhaps, you know, oftentimes the, the instinct, I guess, is to um, train SMEs and enable them to have digital sales capabilities. But what we have seen and the um, commentator here has seen is that, of course, uh, you know, engaging in e-commerce requires an entire uh, um, digitization of the entire company. And we are actually seeing in our research that the companies that are particularly uh, digitized across their business functions are the ones that are most uh, successful in online selling, precisely because they can uh, have their operations, um, uh, uh, streamline their operations and um, scale their transactions with their customers. So to the, to the uh, panelists, um, what are your thoughts about kind of reaching uh, SMEs at greater scale, particularly the informal ones? And how do we um, go kind of deeper with SMEs? Do you have some, some thoughts to share about um, how, how do we do this uh, to have more sustained uh, partnership with SMEs as they launch their digital journey? Katie, if I can maybe, maybe start the ball rolling. Right. Um, one of the things we're busy developing in partnership with, with some of the NGOs that we work with, we're developing on-demand training for, for SME, sorry, my uh, abbreviation is slightly tied, but we're developing virtual, virtual training, so virtual training options to, to cut across COVID. But what we are seeing, and, uh, and I know my friends at UPS have, have set one up already, is, is online web, is, um, web portals, a, a single source of, uh, of truth, so to speak, where they can go and gather information. So creating websites where you can go into it, like a trade website, get copies of templates of common, common customs documents, information about particular trade markets. So there are some trade portals that give very good information about uh, destination markets that are very popular for e-commerce retailers. So it gives them insight and information about their markets when they're researching what the best target markets would be. But what we're finding is particularly attractive right now is on-demand training. In other words, creating trade training modules that you load onto such portals, you make them available to these um, entities at no charge, but it's on demand. So they do it in their own time when they have the time available, maybe in an internet cafe where they're not tied to a particular schedule on a Monday morning at eight o'clock, you must report to this location for your training, but they can grab this training on demand. 
they scalable, so there's, that they're modular, so they are different modules covering different fundamental elements of the, um, of the supply chain. And then, of course, that's coupled with the opportunity to do classroom-based training or virtual online training with a, with, a, with, a, with a subject matter expert. And then we've also found, although it's not as reachable in terms of numbers, we found a particular opportunity in Rwanda where one of the NGOs trained up coaches. And those coaches attend the training. We, I know that I went into Rwanda to do some of the training. We trained up these coaches that were employed on a, they were, they were selected and recruited. And these coaches were to go out into the rural communities and share some of the logistics and, and e-commerce experience that they were trained on to equip the rural communities who wouldn't normally have access to that type of, of training and, and upskilling. And so those are some of the thoughts that I would have on how we reach the, the, uh, the community in that way. Kathy, uh, if I Lisa, may add, some, I know, please. you know, I completely agree with Jason. Um, I'm also like, like uh, Wamik mentioned, UPS is also part of ITC She Trades and, and we have uh, developed courses, online courses that, that women can adapt and they're uh, accessible on phones because that's a big deal, right? It's, it's being able to have the accessibility on the phone so that they can download it and be able to listen to it and, and, and a very didactical um, in, in using clear terms so that, so that they can understand it. So I know UPS has done some, Visa has done others. Um, I, I think there's, there's another element for, for the audience that is here, it, Kathy, in some countries, it, to access the women entrepreneurs, in the informal, formal, or wherever they were, we really needed to partner with the government. Um, and government uh, agencies had more access to, to everybody, right? Uh, the challenge for the governments is they didn't know how to speak SMB or how to speak e-commerce or how to speak, and that's where the partnership comes together, right? And so I do think that we have to be more intentional about that access because putting it online and sending out in social media works up to a point, but you need to have that trust, and, and trust is very important. So that's one thing that 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 I think can help us do better on, on that part. The second one is um, what I have found out in, in, in different regions, and this I include Europe in this because we are also doing our women exporter program in Europe in some cases, is when you go to a more specialized type of, um, and I call it credit unions, but, but more local type of, of associations where you can in person go and connect. And then in one case, for example, we actually got together all the women entrepreneurs in one room, in one of the local associations, put a big TV and gave the training that way. And so they can come there and do it that way. But, but you really have to think outside the box, no pun intended. We move boxes? No, never mind. It's a bad joke. <laughs> but but we but but that's how we are connecting with the women entrepreneurs. And 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 Jason's right, social media is key. That's how they're opening businesses. Um and, and having those platforms make a difference. Wonderful. Yeah, I mean, if you I wanted to mention. Please. Yeah, no, if I, if I quickly mention, like, absolutely, like Maria mentioned, you know, being able to access that on their mobile phones, right, that is absolutely critical. So how do you make it interesting, exciting, convenient, um, you know, that's why like video on a mobile phone could be potentially really powerful with the increasing spread of, um, you know, smartphones in developing country markets. So really thinking through what can be the most easily accessible, convenient, that would maximize the learning and the impact. Um, and so wanted to just sort of really reiterate that point. There is a, also a question on uh, payments and secure payments and how do we um, ensure that B2B, B2C payments um, are, are secure and there's, you know, there are issues with fake invoices and things like that. Well, Meg, I wonder if you might be able to share a little bit about Visa's uh, products and um, what you have seen um, with their uptake in different markets, exactly addressing this issue. Yeah, no, thank you, Katia, and absolutely. So, I mean, uh, payments need to be safe and secure. I mean, that fundamentally is, 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 is core, right? And, abs uh, and I think in terms of um, our products, our solutions, we really put an emphasis on making sure that the safety and security is, is, is the top priority. 
Um, to give you one specific example, uh, we one of our e-commerce uh, solutions uh, is, is, is our cyber source platform. And um, we have uh, rolled that out in a number of uh, markets across the world, uh, you know, in Latin America and others. And we're constantly innovating and upgrading. So um, it has used, you know, it has been leveraging facial recognition technology, for example, to help improve the safety and security and, and other features. But um, this is sort of one of the solutions that Visa has to help uh, support e-commerce in, in a number of developing countries and, and, and just wanted to uh, emphasize that, you know, there needs to be a constant investment into facial recognition and other technologies and innovations to keep that up to date with the increasing uh, changes and trends and patterns in terms of cybersecurity and, and um, other kinds of issues. So um, that's very important. Wonderful, probably enables, um, is a very scalable uh, solution um, also with the informal uh, sector potentially. Uh, we have another um, set of uh, solutions that we're working toward in the E-Trade Alliance that perhaps enable us to scale uh, support for SMEs and enable SMEs to navigate in the digital economy as there's more and more tools and services available online. And as Erica mentioned, some of those require for you to be a formal company, but uh, increasingly these are also kind of hybrid or more flexible solutions. And we're working on a digital identity a pilot for SMEs to be authenticated faster by their vendors, say a bank or a marketplace or logistics companies that require some data on SMEs. Um, essentially, SMEs would not have to carry a, a bunch of keys in their pocket to open these various digital doors, but have one master key with which to um, onboard uh, digital services and be authenticated. And of course, vice versa for their buyers, their customers to authenticate uh, these SMEs that they are legitimate uh, uh, companies. So we're looking to pilot this in the E-Trade Alliance as hopefully a, a flagship uh, initiative uh, going forward as well to, to enable this scalability. But it is, it is an excellent question that um, uh, various individuals have posted in the in the chat about how do we reach SMEs at, at scale. Erica, I think there's one uh, question tailored to you, which is about how do we um, can change the mentality not only for uh, women and, and enable women-led firms, but how do we do that with men-led firms so that men-led firms can see that women uh, can be leaders um, and um, uh, women can also be their bosses and CEOs. This is, of course, an issue still in in some markets, and we see also in our work over and over that um, uh, women at firms uh, tend to hire many more women. So, so um, uh, whereas men at firms tend to hire many more men. So, uh, how do we yeah, how do we socialize men into seeing women as leaders? I know you've been working a great deal on this issue and actually operationalize some programs. I think that the best practice is to show uh, inspirational cases is to include gender content in our courses, for example, with images, with uh, content about uh, women successful cases. Um, other practice is to do a focus group or, or groups to, to, to work uh, with a, a specific topic, for example, um, I think we can change the, the, the mind. It's very important. It's, not, it's our issue uh, in this life. Um, it's our mission in Italy Alliance. Um, and I think um, uh, with mentorship, with um, accompanying um, uh, SMEs uh, and a sponsor SMEs, mentor and a sponsor, we, we can um, create, for example, an, an allyship program uh, in order to um, reach mentors uh, to provide uh, mentoring, coaching, networking. Uh, I, I believe this is the, 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 the pathway to, to increase the, the opportunities for women, to show that it's possible to do businesses it's possible to do businesses globally. Um, I think um, the, the technologies uh, will change, the technologies will update, uh, but I think the most important transfer to knowledge is you can, 
you can do businesses and you can do businesses globally. It's, um, it's a way to, to train. It's, um, it's a particular uh, way to train. Learning by doing, implement the knowledge and uh, change the mind. Change the mind in all aspects, not only in e-commerce, okay? In leadership, e-commerce, financial, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, I, I will share with you some, some ideas or initiatives that uh, you are, the, the majority of the participants are, uh, are implementing uh, projects for uh, their countries. Uh, I think we need more trainers. Uh, in this sense, um, it's great to train about formally, uh, formal businesses, but I don't know if we have enough people with capacity to train about these issues in digital commerce. Um, obviously, obviously, sorry, uh, there are specialists, but I don't know if uh, we we have the, the enough people to, to train. So um, uh, as uh, Maria Luisa mentioned, it's very important um, the networking, the alliances. E-commerce Institute is, a, is an example of alliances. We uh, are a great network. We are um, the most important chambers and e-commerce associations of Latin America. Uh, and we are working together with associations and chambers uh, with these issues. And it's important to um, approach to SMEs these tools and these networkings uh, to, uh, to approach the, the sources of information. Uh, I think we need to, to, to work in this sense, Kati. Fantastic. Um, Erika, you've given this a great deal of thought, and this is a really a, a fantastic way to wrap up our panel. Uh, unfortunately, we're starting to be out of time. I know there's many more questions. Uh, thank you all for fantastic uh, participation. There's a lot uh, for us to absorb also in the chat, and thank you for sharing all kinds of documents and uh, diagnostics with us um, and your ideas as well. And I really want to thank our uh, great uh, panel. Uh, Maria Luisa, Jason, Wamek, uh, Erika for their uh, contributions. Uh, just to wrap up with a couple of uh, thoughts, I think what we learned and heard a lot about is the need that SME e-commerce is not only about SMEs, right? It's about uh, transport infrastructure, digital infrastructure issues. Um, it is also about interoperability among the digital tools and technologies um, that SMEs are increasingly using, interoperability of um, uh, digital regulations, as well as government regulations, and, and teaching governments about uh, the policy challenges that SMEs are facing and adjusting uh, customs, uh, taxes, all kinds of areas of policymaking to the needs of SMEs um, in e-commerce. And then we learned a great deal about different tactics and strategies to reach SMEs at scale, uh, thoughts about how to um, use uh, technology to reach um, SMEs, also the informal ones, and the need that we've been emphasizing in the Trade Alliance to, to tailor approaches to different segments of SMEs. There's many, many of them, um, and uh, not only by gender, uh, but also by their readiness for the digital economy. So uh, very, very rich panel, uh, very wide ranging. I appreciate our panelists, uh, great insights, and also your uh, leadership in the E-Trade Alliance. And with that, I'll turn it back over to our moderators. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kati. On behalf of the Market Links production team, we wanna thank you so much for joining us today and for such a great discussion. Feel free to um, add any additional comments or questions you have into the chat. And as mentioned previously, um, we will post this recording as well as the slides on the Market Links website. But thank you again for joining us. And thanks also to our LinkedIn Live listeners. Um, and have a great rest of the day. And you can exit out um, just like any other um, in the lower right-hand corner where it says leave. Thank you. Mm -hmm.